Okay. Is that is that okay? Um, let's let's test it now. If it's not working, then just do it with your okay. computer. Okay. Let's go with your yeah, okay. computer. <laughs> so, okay, you have computer. Yeah. So maybe you have you have Mac. Could you put it for one one Mac, both files? Yeah, so yeah, we sure. don't need to change it sure. for both. And Agnes. It's all these images. Well, I was going to use uh, some of them, but it looks like some of them, for some reason, have been reversed. Okay, I'm going to make you up yeah. with your name folder. Okay. Yeah. So when you come to here, just open it. So, and well, I'll put all so you can make a selection while you are presenting. Is there any way to rotate some of these? I don't know why they're not rotated. Because they were supposed to be rotated. I can sh show you how to do it. So when you open a file, then mm -hmm. there is this, this green ones. So it's a turn it. As okay. you want, then you just press forward. And then you can turn it again if it's needed. Okay, so this is basically this one. Yeah. Okay. So we have uh, five files here, and then two is coming <laughs> from there, and yours. Mm -hmm. I just need to check which stick. <laughs> okay. It's a pause. Okay, this is saying it's not here at least. <coughs> it, it doesn't all open this this one. So if you can try to open this with uh, com other other computer. No, we have to do it, no? Yeah. But it's not opening. Oh, I see what you mean. So okay. Well, I can do that. So. You want to test that one? Yeah, just, okay. just to see. Um, 
So, no. yes. so if uh, if you go with last, Alison and Senna, and if we could start with Agnes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so everybody, very welcome. Thank you. Welcome to the satellite platform. The satellite platform device will be there in the data, and then the Google will be there so everything will be in English. So I would like to wish everybody welcome on behalf of Koi Art Museum, the artists, and uh, everyone else involved, and uh, streaming the, we are streaming the uh, whole uh, evening online uh, by Koi Art Museum website and artists website. And uh, I think it's the best that everybody introduce themselves when they start, because if you the, the line so Yes. Yeah, we, we will just go ahead, because we are so many, so we'll kick off. Thank you. Yes, uh, welcome from my behalf also. We have had uh, quite little time to prepare for this, but... Uh, we have had uh, quite little time to prepare for this. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. Okay, actually, yeah. I'll close this one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so see, that there's the streaming going on. Yeah, so let's start with Agnes, and then uh, with Christy, Martha, Dusty, Megan, Virpi, Alexandra, and Sena, and Alison last. And if there is some technical problems, then we'll, we'll figure it out. But let's start with this. So everybody has maximum 10 minutes time to present what they have. And, and uh, okay, that's, that's my part. And if there's technical problems, uh, just come here, I'll, I'll come. Okay, now, I might need some help. Yeah. Okay, are you going to be close? <laughs> now? Oh, okay. You have to give him a cue. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Agnes, and I live in Astoria, Oregon. I'm a curator and an artist, and I work with a couple of organizations. One is called At Kala, which is part of hitfishmonthly.com, and the other is Astoria Visual Arts, of which I'm a founding uh, board director. Can you talk a bit about this? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Astoria, Oregon is o uh, located on the mouth of the Columbia River. It's a population of, of about 12,000 people. And uh, it's a very small but very active art, active town. There's um, a lot of uh, artists, filmmakers, poets, writers, and all of them uh, seem to pass through at various times. Um, Astoria has become very well known because of all the Hollywood films that have been made there. Uh, things like Kindergarten Cop, um, The Goonies, and so on. And so much of the art is being um, um, so sometimes overshadowed by the work that is being done by Hollywood. So you'll have artists hanging out with uh, celebrities and filmmakers, and uh, it's a very interesting mix of people. I primarily work with um, emerging artists. Um, there is a website that's called Kala at Hitfish Monthly, and I forgot to tell Tamo about that website, so it isn't listed on the program, but it's Kala at Hitfish Monthly. I have a newspaper that is also published once a month. It has a distribution of about um, 100,000 that covers the northwest coast of Oregon. 
Uh, my most recent lecture was with Betsy Millard, who is the former uh, curator at the St. Louis Art Museum, and she was speaking about uh, her experiences in Cologne with Gerhard Richter. I sometimes, as a curator in a small area, instead of working for a large institution, I have to spend my time doing a lot of fundraising. So the lectures help raise money for other lectures and also artist presentations. So that particular lecture will raise the money for the next lecture that's scheduled for May 10th, which will be Richard Spear, who's the art writer and critic for the Willamette Week and also for Art Forum and Art News and so on. Um, <clears throat> One of my most recent installations was a, a program called Camp which was working with a couple of artists from Portland State University, part of the new uh, Art and Social Practices program that was established by the um, uh, biennial artist Harold Fletcher. And I, I work a great deal with Portland State University primarily because I like the programs <coughs> that they're doing and I like the Art and Social Practices um, position that they are presenting. Camp was like a faux camp that was in the gallery space and, and the audience was invited to come in. Uh, the artists basically gathered found material and made a kind of faux camping area and also a faux uh, tent. It looked a bit like a refugee camp, but was a little bit um, uh, more user friendly. So the audience it developed the idea as um, the audience being part of the participation in the actual art uh, process, which worked quite well. It was very popular with uh, people. They felt very comfortable coming in and making things out of found material, hanging them on the wall, and then selling the, the utensils for uh, pieces of art. I want to go to at least one of the images here, I hope. A lot of my images turned out to be uh, <coughs> Is that up? Double. Yeah, there we go. This is uh, Stephen Beattie, who it teaches contemporary sculpture at Portland State University, uh, alternative materials, and part of his practice is to use recycled material, primarily uh, swimming pool floats and light. He creates very large scale um, uh, pieces. And this particular one is meant to be uh, displayed against the wall. It's called Pacific Sunset. <clears throat> so it looks like a sunset with a reflection on the water. So. Let's see, we we'll go back to. Oh, let's see, I don't want that. Let's see. Let's see. This is not my like my computer. There we go. <coughs> See, in my own practice, I use um, a large scale um, styrofoam that I started using primarily when I was working in uh, Italy, working on my graduate work. And this is sort of one example. They're they're four by eight. Double click. Double click here. I need my tech guy. <laughs> here we go. Okay. I'll I'll do this one if that one won't click. Yeah, it's just a little slow lady, uh, loading. But these basically are large scale, um, uh, the four by eight sheets of styrofoam that are coated with plaster. Um, and then uh, one reason I like this is because when I was working with frescoes in Italy the panels became extremely heavy and I couldn't move them around to various places. Um, so I loved uh, switching to the styrofoam to be able to lift and carry and, and move things and also able to shape the various um, uh, panels. Oops. The work that's currently in the studio, which I don't have images of, and I could show you a few more of these images if I can figure out how to rotate them. Um, this is one of the other images here. Let's see. 
I can't see the rotation. <coughs> Sorry about that. I'm going to have to not do that. Uh, the current work in the studio is called Cascadian Biophilia. Uh, it's work that is maybe half completed, and the work is, is um, uh, about the area called Cascadia, which is from southern Yukon to northern California. It's an area that's kind of based on, um, uh, primarily on uh, geographical issues that are similar in the area and also some political issues that relate to um, the local northwest uh, area. It has titles like Happiness Falls and Sleeping in Trees, Bone in the Teeth, Squall Line. So it, it has some um, landscape elements, but primarily working with um, things that are um, close to process and working with process and discovering and translating opposites. I like to work with opposites, things that are more controlled and then things that are more chaotic. So you can see that in some of the work. Um, I like the way uh, the surface becomes space. And in many of the work, much of the work, the space will um, be changing quite quite rapidly. So I don't have images of that particular work. I do have images of some of the work that I've been doing here. Um, <coughs> and the images here, let's see if I can find one that's the right side up here. Oh, jeez. Um, part of what I was doing, um, because some of my heritage is, is uh, Finnish American. I was uh, looking at similarities between the Finnish heritage and my Native American heritage. So I was working with sauna ash and, and making small constructions out of the sauna ash um, this one's out of plaster but I'm trying to find the ones that are made out of sauna ash, and then photographing them and using them there. Some of these are, this one's rotated, unfortunately, but this is using the, the actual charcoal from the sauna ash. These are smaller scale works. This is also the sauna ash. And then I started experimenting a little bit with uh, using the, the birch, the actual birch bark and photographs of images to express some of my feelings about the sauna. And I'm really sorry about this rotation issue. <laughs> one, one minute. One minute. Um, I'd rather be okay. All right. Thank you. The other reason I'm here is to learn a little bit about um, Scandinavian or Finnish art because I'm a part of uh, uh, why I came was working with Astoria Visual Arts and Kala is to create uh, an artist in residency program to promote at least one or two <coughs> Finnish artists to live in the West Coast for a period of time. So it's, since I didn't know that much about Finnish art and Finnish artists, um, <coughs> this is one reason for being here. So. I'd like to thank uh, Demo and Ardalus for allowing me to have a position to be able to come and learn a little bit about uh, Finnish art. I guess that's about all I can do at this point. Thank you. Hello, I'm Christy Highlander. I'm going to find my presentation. Okay, well, while it's loading, um, I'm currently living and working in Richmond, Virginia. I grew up on various, in various places on the East Coast because my father was in the military. And I came to Richmond to... Uh-oh. You, <laughs> slideshow. <laughs> Use that icon at the bottom I don't next to 
That? Yeah. Okay. Got it. <laughs> um, oh yeah, okay. I came to Richmond in 2006 to attend school and I graduated in 2010 with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Communication Arts. Uh, since then, I've been working full-time at the Visual Arts Center of Richmond and work on my own work outside of that. I do various drawings and painting commissions, and for the past year, I've been doing regular um, illustrations for publication. So those are, these are some of my commissions. This is private commission. People love pictures of their pets. <laughs> Uh, this is one I did for a short-lived magazine in Brooklyn. And this tattoo that you see was somebody that I don't know, but I saw randomly in a picture that he got a tattoo of my work, which is super weird, but flattering, I suppose. Um, this is an editorial illustration, a spot illustration that was published. And I did a series of motorcycle illustrations that they used on t-shirts and in posters. Um, I've been a part of Mayo Island Studio Collective since it was founded in 2011, and there's about 10 other artists in the studio that work in a variety of media, and it's a really cool place to work. <laughs> this is our space. We have the entire top floor, and there's some cabinet workers below us. This is my studio space when it's clean, me working, and that's another view of our space. So I've participated in various group shows and had two solo shows, which were both last year, one in January and then another at the end of the year. So I'm going to show you some various images from last year's shows. Some oil painting, drawings. Mm -hmm. Michael McDonald. <laughs> um, so I enjoy working in several disciplines. I do photography, graphic design, drawing, and painting. But, um, as you can probably see, I'm generally interested in drawing, and I frequently use pen and ink and then add color with acrylic. Sometimes I do just straight oil paintings, so that's a little bit more rare. Um, as far as subject matter and content, I'm really interested in the idea of beliefs, whether that's science, folklore, conspiracy theories, religion, it's, um, and just where we choose to place our convictions and however tenuous or probable those may be. I like researching different beliefs and sometimes try to convince myself that they're true just by going to different sources. Like if I want to believe in aliens, I just go to a UFO forum and just <laughs> read different stories and hear about people that actually believe in it just to see if I can convince myself of it. But most of the times at the end of the day, I, my logic kicks in, my skepticism, and I can't actually believe it, which is probably wise, a healthy thing. Um, so I did get pretty interested in UFOs and researching alien contact. So I did a series called Transmission, which I'll show you a few pieces from that series, that period in my life. <laughs> uh, it started with this one. And it was, this whole series was sort of kicked off by this organization called SETI, which is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. They have a huge array of telescopes and send radio messages to space to reach intelligent life forms, which I think is awesome and hilarious. This one's based off of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. If you've seen it, you might recognize why this is important. Um, so as far as process, I'm pretty consistent with keeping sketchbooks, and a lot of my finished pieces originate there, um, such as this piece. These are just a few sketches. They're based off uh, Arthur C. Clarke yeah, Arthur C. Clarke's story from the 1950s. It's about this guy that's just stuck in space, and at one point he lights up a cigarette inside his helmet in space. And this guy was writing in the middle of the century, so obviously their view of the future was far different, but I just thought that was really an interesting thought about a spaceman lighting up a cigarette in like a vacuum of space. <laughs> so I wanted to illustrate that. And this is the final piece. Um, I usually use my friends or myself as a reference and take photos whenever I can. Um, this is one such reference. <laughs> this guy I actually found in a coffee shop because I was like, oh my god, I knew I was doing this illustration. And he's like, you would be perfect for my Rasputin <laughs> illustration, which is super creepy. He came over to my house and took his photo, but he was really nice and he didn't murder me, so that was good. Um, and then currently at Artilus, I've been working on just exploring different media and concepts to create a new body of work when I get home. So this is a drawing that I did of a goat, clearly. 
And this is a photo reference that I took, <laughs> which was before I came. It was from last summer. And then the piece that I did at Artlist. It's the final one. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everyone, hello. Um, so I haven't got a PowerPoint presentation, I've just got loads of things. <laughs> so I'm going to hand them around. Do you want to thank you behind you? Huh? Well, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm based in Leeds, in West Yorkshire, in the north of England. Um, I, my, I'll tell you a little bit about my history and how I got started. Um, I, I haven't studied art. I started working at a film festival, the Leeds International Film Festival, in 2004 as a programmer, film programmer. And um, somewhere along in that time, I got really, really interested in artist cinema as a form, and particularly analog artist cinema, so film on Super 8, Standard 8, 9.5, 16mm, and 35mm film. Um, and I met some people. We formed a collective and we used to get together and, and process our own films in, in each other's bathrooms and that kind of thing. So I got a very kind of hands-on um, experience of, of my art form from an early time. So all throughout this period I was also curating films. So I've m recently made this kind of transition from being a curator to being an artist and it's a bit of a weird transition to make. So. I set up this organization called Cherry Kino, um, and that used to be about me curating and showing screenings and making old warehouses into cinemas for a weekend. And now it's kind of morphed more into my own practice and um, teaching as well. So I teach other people how to make films, specifically how to operate cameras and um, how to hand process their own films as well. Um, in terms of what I love about analog filmmaking and what draws me to it. It's quite a physical thing for me. Um, I edit almost entirely by hand using a splicer. So I cut the film and it brings a whole new meaning to the expressions used in digital filmmaking, cutting and pasting and all the rest, because I really am cutting and pasting. And um, when I watch the rushes, I do kind of get a physical rush as well. Um, so I like projecting film in its real form. And this is something that I explored when I did my master's. So I went back seven years after doing a, a degree and um, did a master's in experimental cinema. Um, and that was a really, really fascinating experience for me to explore more why I'm so drawn to this, this medium. Um, so some might call me, say, a fetishist about things because I'm really into, you know, I'm so bad with digital media. I've only got two films that are digitized. I've made about five or six. Um, I don't even know how to make a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> I just know how to, how to touch things, really. Um, I'm also a projectionist, so I know how to project film. Um, so I, what I studied in my master's partly was to do with the experience of synesthesia which is where the senses come together. Um, for example, you can have colored hearing or you can taste shapes. So it's a, it's a double experience or even triple or sometimes more than that. And my thesis or my feeling that I wanted to prove was that um, certain kinds of cinema can elicit a synesthetic response in the viewer. And what I discovered, it was pretty damn hard to prove, I'll tell you that, um, but what I discovered was that it is partly connected to how a piece is made. So I believe in a kind of an ethics of production. 
Um, and that's what I try and apply to my filmmaking. Um, so for that, that might mean letting your authorial control over something go a bit and letting the material tell you what you need to do with it. So I don't tend to approach things with a preconceived idea that I want to follow through from start to finish. It's more about seeing what happens and that includes filming as well. So I, I very rarely go out with an intention of I'm going to film that, I'm going to film that. I just take my camera and, and see what pulls me to it and film it and then see what it, how it wants me to play with it and change it. Um, so what I also looked into in my masters was fetishism as a concept and um, it was really interesting to look at how a very, very long time ago, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, with the Portuguese going to Africa, they developed this concept of feticio, um, taken from the African term, which is something I can't pronounce. And um, they saw these objects that were being treated as, like, really revered, special, sacred objects. And they thought this was a little bit stupid, you know. They just wanted to buy these objects because they were kind of interesting. But they didn't want to have to deal with all the other contexts around these objects, like the ceremonies and the social relationships and political contexts of it. And so they kind of thought, oh, there are these, you know, stupid natives who put too much value on an object. Um, and the, the concept that we know now is of fetishism, there are a few um, variations of it, but they kind of stem from this approach, which doesn't look at the context of the, of the object and how it gets its magic, you know. And I think that fetishism needs to be re-evaluated and kind of reappropriated as a positive thing. So I would say, yes, I'm a fetishist and um, I enjoy it. And I think that it's to do with um, putting the meaning back into the context around the material. Um, Yeah. So, for example, there's like a Marxist concept of fetishism where the object has been cut off from its mode of production or means of production and therefore has this kind of supernatural glow about it and extra value because of that. Whereas I disagree and I think that things have value because they spill out and, and they can't stop themselves from sharing the context that they come from. So, to sort of summarise my view and how I apply that to film, is um, that I believe how I treat the material, how I feel when I'm filming, how I hand process all my things as well. Um, my kind of personal investment in the material, I believe and hope, comes through as um, an expanded sensorium in the, in the viewer, um, so that it kind of transfers in a, in a physical way, not just a visual way. So I'm going to pass around a couple of bits of film, for example, that I've been processing at Artelez. <coughs> and um, yeah. no, no. Yeah, so I touch, touch the film a lot. Um, so I also have this feeling that when, when I'm shooting, Something that's very different to, to work in the digital media is that I know, I can hear it going through, I know its length as well as time, and I know its work, I know I'm going to have to deal with all of that material and kind of process it and the rest of it. So I, I have this feeling that it makes me more present in the moment when I'm capturing those images. Um, rather than this kind of catching everything now and then doing loads of post production later. I invest myself quite a lot in the moment um, and I think that that's key to sensations. So for example, aesthetics meaning <coughs> sensation, aesthesis from the Greek meaning sensations. Um, I look at aesthetics not just as something visual but as something sensual of the whole body. Um, so I explored this a little bit as a curator as well, where I programmed a, a series of films that were made without a traditional lens, because there's a kind of argument that the lens in filmmaking is um, a very ocular-centric, very eye-based thing, 
um, that connects it just to a sort of Cartesian way of looking, where you, where you have a kind of fixed perspective and it's all to do with the brain being better than the rest of the body, or the eyes being the sense that are the most intelligent somehow. And I think that by using a pinhole instead of a lens, you kind of destabilize that view and approach more of a kind of bodily aesthetics. So something I was experimenting with at Artelais is um, pinhole Polaroids. So you've got this, like, ironically, this instant medium that takes like forever to make a photo. So between, well, between one and a half and six minutes, each of these. So uh, maybe I'll hand these around too. Um, I really like the process of spending time while an image is happening and being made. And I find it kind of quite meditative as well. So another thing that I love about annual filmmaking is that the film is actually there at the time. So um, there were some sort of accidental ones as well here, but the film was really there. It's really a witness to the light that was there. It's a material witness to what was happening. You can't Photoshop it, you know. So um, maybe I'll quickly say something else about words. All right, in one minute. That um, words are problematic for me. They have been for a long time because I grew up very much with them. Um, I studied English language and literature, and I just my parents were English teachers, and I just felt that the language wasn't mine, it was one that was put on me and, and film and love of film and photographic image really came um, because of that as an escape. I suddenly felt I had a language that was mine but recently words have started coming back in and they feel like mine again so I'm writing some poetry and um, words are quite important in the themes of my film as well and the meanings that I take from my film. So. One example is like <clears throat> Anangela, Queen of Cups, is a film I recently made. Mary Anning was a woman who collected fossils and sold them on the beach in the 1800s in England. And she, was, uh, she made some huge discoveries about dinosaurs and things, and she was like, overlooked in the history books, partly because she was a woman and because she was a working-class woman mm -hmm. as well. Um, but recently, she's kind of gained um, more attention and there was a species named after her that was a sea creature called Anangela. And then the second part of the title is Queen of Cups, and that's from a kind of a dream that I had, as well as the connection with a tarot card. So, yeah. I think that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, my name is Dusty Rabjohn. Uh, I'm another American artist. Uh, I'm from originally from Ohio, um, but I live in Chicago, Illinois now. Um, I went to undergrad in Columbus, Ohio, and then I did my master's in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little overview of what I'll present. Um, I'll just do a really quick little brief bio about myself, um, really in a nutshell, a little bit of my personal kind of art philosophy. Um, and if it doesn't, if that's not clear, maybe at the end, um, you know, you can ask me to clarify if you have any questions or anything. Um, it'll hopefully become apparent in some of the work that I show. So. Um, 
Let me just first start by saying uh, a little bit about myself that applies to my work. Um, so in my late teens, I became pretty interested in politics. Um, my artwork then kind of uh, had no choice but to reflect strong feelings that I had about things like just injustice in general, war, um, uh, inequality. And I think as an American, that is particularly pertinent um, given the power and influence of the um, of that country. Um, also, I really believe that as an American, I share responsibility for what that country does and um, doesn't necessarily need to mean my, my actions need to manifest themselves into artwork, but as a, you know, I'm going to paint and therefore I can't help but um, let my feelings kind of invade my, my artwork. Um, as much as I'm interested in current events, specific current events, I try not to necessarily uh, represent those specifics in artwork. I tend to lean more towards trying to understand and investigate kind of a deeper psychology and um, you know human nature involved in that type of conflict. So the work that I'll show um, it's not necessarily sequential, but by and large, it's old, getting to more recent work. Um, so given my sort of interests, the next question then is really, how do I decide to make artwork? Um, so I, I, tr I really try to come up with simple but provoking images. Um, I like to try and include the viewer pretty actively in the, the scenery. Um, I also really would like to um, end up with an image which has some kind of vagueness and incomplete um, incompleteness about it. Um, I feel like there's a in the past with work I've done and other work that I've seen too, particularly with realism, um, when it's really really finished and polished, it has a way of um, becoming kind of impenetrable. You know, it's very image based and very hard to actually kind of get into. Um, I like to think of it kind of as a, as a really glossy like Hollywood action film where it's really entertaining but it kind of makes you forget about life. You sit there and you enjoy the film and you're kind of told what to think and how to feel um, as opposed to something that's a bit maybe more slowly paced, open, incomplete, unfinished and that really makes you um, not forget about life but think about life and um, and also use your kind of imag imagination and, and uh, you know, dialogue with yourself to kind of fill in some of the blanks. Um, that's kind of how I think of painting as well, of dealing with the surface. Um, so this particular one that we're looking at, um, it's just called aggression. Um, in this case, I was really interested in exploring just the nature of, mostly of fear, fear and aggression and violence. Um, I wanted to set up kind of a vague scenario in which there's a violent confrontation that, that seems to be happening, though there's really no um, signifier of anything happening. For instance, the uh, aggressor's hand is plainly open and relaxed. Uh, the other figure that's uh, in a defensive posture is addressing the viewer, um, and it's meant to be sort of like a three-figured composition where we have the Suppose an aggressor, the victim, and then kind of the audience that they're making contact with is the third person that's implicit in the scene. So, um, and maybe you can question whether you're taking part in it, whether you're, yeah. It looks so detailed. How long do you explain? How long? Uh, it depends, but it's hard to put a number of hours on it. Maybe, um, I think this one I probably worked on for like three months, but not. Continuous, yeah. You like Andrew White? Uh, Andrew White, painter or photographer? I'm not sure I'm familiar with. Andrew Wyatt. Oh, Wyatt. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. You do? Uh, yeah, I like his work, yeah. 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 Uh, one other thing that you might notice about this one, then I'll move on, is um, well, the shirt is a really big expanse of space, and if you look closely, you can kind of see some of the background transitioning through that. Um, so he's meant to become a bit of an apparition. Um, 
um, and also kind of a space in which the viewer can kind of enter the, the painting. Uh, Size-wise, I should mention this is, uh, I don't have it all translated into meters, but it's, um, I guess, about a meter and a half square. And this one is about, uh, what, about almost four meters wide, so it's quite large. Uh, this one's titled Nature. It's really just um, an investigation of kind of uh, growth, destruction, you know, beauty and horror, peace and violence, all that sort of thing. If you can notice, there's a kind of a random pile of um, wounded or dead animal in the center. Um, I, I really like the forest as a, particularly the American forest as kind of a, um, this place where it's, there's kind of somehow this implicit fear, you know, it's used in every horror movie and something about it, and maybe it's not particular to the American forest, but the forest itself is very isolated and also somehow claustrophobic with, you know, so much um, surroundings. Um, so I just kind of like, like uh, exploring this type of scenery. Um, also, just in terms of painting, by having so much kind of repetitive elements, it really allowed me to at least try to um, relax and loosen up with the paint a little bit more. There's more freedom to kind of make errors and to make marks. They're not going to disturb the overall reading of the image because it's both large and complex. Um, so that's, that's also kind of a concern is, is kind of how to um, paint the images in such a way that that, that um, gives that kind of incomplete and vague result that I was talking about early on. This one was actually completed somewhat recently, but it was started back maybe five years before that, um, so it doesn't seem to belong anywhere, but I placed it with the, the, um, the nature image because it's kind of got the same um, idea of a, of a sense of kind of overwhelming all over um, stuff and detail. Um, and again, it was kind of for the purpose of me to also try and be able to open up with the, the painting style a bit. Um, this one's just titled America. It's meant to be a little bit provocative, but not an insult. Um, and this one I just kind of wanted to have. A, it's, a, it's the overlooked, overhead look of a dumpster um, with the frame of the dumpster kind of framing the painting. Um, again, there's something hidden in this one. If you can see, there's a just a small hand of a child here. <laughs> and there's supposed to be a direct correlation with that child and the, the waste um, and consumption that's, that's in the bin. Um, I was really, I guess, trying to talk about how dominantly sort of, bu how, how business heavy and sort of how our American society is a business-run society um, and how the result of that is that, you know, profit is placed above people and that, um, you know, consumption is kind of, and consumerism is, is kind of a way of life. Uh, you know, people are taught to have artificial wants and desires. Um, also, just the, that kind of generic idea of America as a, land of opportunity, and um, which is really related to this kind of capitalist ideology. So. This one is just called Terror. Again, kind of trying to have a nondescript, vague, but somehow familiar image. So obviously it's um, related to the Middle East, but not specific, necessarily specific to any particular um, issue or, or, or region. Um, and again, kind of trying to engage the viewer actively, so the figure is addressing the viewer directly, tossing a stone. Um, I always think of, there was, I don't know if you guys remember, but George Bush had a famous question, you know, why do they hate us? And that was kind of the, what I was thinking about with, the, with this piece. Uh, you just have a detail, and then this one's quite large. Um, I don't have a scale image, but it's it's uh, it's like 13 feet, so it's 
maybe four meters by three and a half meters or something like that. <clears throat> um, how am I doing on time? Okay. Okay. So I had a series. I'm just going to show you three. I had a series of ten drawings. This was for a show which was titled Terror. It was a group show, um, part of a collective that I was participating in. Um, and I had to do small works and simple works because I was sending them to New Zealand, so I did some drawings. <clears throat> drawings, And uh, they were all just taking sort of stereotypical American heroes or Western heroes um, and putting them in kind of defensive postures. Every aggressive act is always claimed as defense, defensive, you know, and I kind of wanted to do this to expose the absurdity of that claim. So we have people like Superman who's pissing his pants and um, kind of... Uh, <laughs> so those are the only three I have to show, but there's ten of them. You can see more on the website. Um, oh, and yeah, this is just a shot of my, stu my uh, both living and working space. Um, and basically I kind of rotate art. This is not, the original art was drawings, but I transferred them to bigger panels, so... See those again. Um, I've since then kind of, I haven't strayed away from my um, overall interest, but I have started focusing on animals as a subject matter. Um, this particular one, I, I, it's hard to say much about because I did it for another artist friend, and we did a kind of an exchange piece. And, but one of the kind of shared interests we had with our work was this kind of primal primal instinctual things. In her case, it was sexual. In mine, it was more with violence. And so um, that was kind of where this, this, this piece came from. Um, what I started to like about the idea of the animals, though, was, was kind of using them as symbolic for um, primal beings or, or indigenous, indigenous peoples, you know, kind of the so-called other people of the earth. Um, this was another piece done specifically for a theme show, which was dealing with, it was a Day of the Dead event, so it was dealing with um, remembering people gone, um, and again, just kind of using the animal as a way of taking a, an objective look at um, whatever it may be, in this case, um, you know, the rituals and um, the way we treat, rituals surrounding death, um, the way we treat the time. time? Okay, let me just skip through and show you the last couple images then. <laughs> so this is what I've done here so far. <laughs> okay. Hey guys, my name is Megan. Um, I have some business cards being passed around during my presentation if you want to take one you can. Um, anyway, I'm a fiber artist based out of Kansas City. Um, I graduated from the Kansas City Art Institute in May 2012 with a BFA in fiber and art history. Um, and I just wanted to give you guys a super brief chronology of some of the stuff I've been working on. Um, when I started school, I started working for Kansas City designer Peggy Noland, um, and I worked with her for four years, still doing a few projects with her, but this is where I worked for four years, a giant monster hand, um, and this is like really typical of Kansas City aesthetic, like this sort of feeling. Anyway, it was super fun, and I feel like working with her definitely like influenced a lot of the ways I look at art, and I look at the art world, and myself, and etc. Um, here's images of a few projects we've worked on together. On the left, yeah, on the left is um, a project we did for Fisher Spooner for performance at MoMA in New York. On the right is a, 
costume design we did for the Owen Cox Ballet Company. If you can't tell, this is for the Nutcracker. <laughs> um, since I was working with Peggy, a lot of my work kind of changed more towards wearables, um, or I guess geared more towards wearables. And um, dyeing and color is a huge aspect of my work. Everything in this collection was hand dyed, and I think that's super important for me um, then, and it still is now. Um, so this was shown at the West 18th Street Fashion Show in Kansas City, which is one of the most well-attended shows in the area. But anyway, another few images of the same collection. Um, a lot of the color palettes that I was working with then, I'm still working with today. Um, but this was one of the more like wearable collections I did, and I thought it was really boring. So I wanted to do something a little bit more sculptural. Um, so I moved on to this body of work where I was still working with a few similar materials, um, but I started working with things that were a little bit more unconventional. I was using clear vinyl and foam padding and combining all of these materials and creating new textures and surfaces and still using traditional textile processes like quilting and hand dyeing. Um, I became really interested in padding the body and seeing how applying padding to different parts of the body would change the way we view it and how we felt within a garment. Um, also, since I was quilting, I started experimenting a lot with um, what I could put in the quilted objects, I guess. And I started, I was using different fabric and materials, like weird stuff. Um, but the thing that interests me the most was definitely water. Um, here is a piece I did, and it's a bunch of little heat-sealed water packets made into a dress. And I don't consider this a finalized piece. It's more of like a tradition or a transitional piece for me, where my work became less about creating wearable garments and more about um, experimenting with unconventional materials and combining strange materials to create new surfaces. And I don't know if you can tell or not, but this is completely unwearable. It's all water, so it's super heavy. And you can't actually wear it. Anyway, so since my work was transitioning more towards unwearable, um, I decided to go completely off the body and work more sculpturally. Um, this is a vinyl backpack filled with water. Um, and moving into accessories was really easy for me because it was in the same vein and I wanted to continue the same conversation. Um, and I also thought it was interesting making things that were um, intended to be completely utilitarian but kind of obliterating the functionality of it. Um, so since this is filled with water and super heavy, again, it's really impractical to use, but you can technically use it if you want. Um, <laughs> the water is in the lining of the bag, so I have like shirts in there that are completely dry and, you know, drawstring, whatever, you can use it. Um, this is another piece created with the same idea in mind. Um, another backpack filled with water, dry things inside. Um, this was one of my pieces for my thesis show. Anyway. Um, I heat sealed the plastic so the water is like stuck in there, but you can't, like, your hand wouldn't get wet if you put your hand in the bag. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, so anyway, I was working with the same idea, still hand dyeing everything, same materials for a while. And as I started showing my work, I started noticing that people would always touch my stuff. Like whenever it was in a gallery, I would always catch someone like, you know, grabbing and squeezing and like poking and prodding. And I was thought that was like super weird because I've never experienced going to an art gallery and thinking it was okay to touch stuff and also seeing people touching stuff. So I was really angry at first, but then I decided, or I guess I thought about it for a while and realized, well, if people are doing this on their own accord, it's definitely something I need to look into and capitalize on. So I made this piece, um, which is a set of levers. The back one is about waist height, so these are, you know, pretty big. Um, mm -hmm. And then on top of these levers are two bags filled with water, and they're hand-dyed. Again, these bags are super heavy. Um, 
But I wanted to make a piece that was, I guess, the like language for presenting it was really relatable. So I presented them on two mm -hmm. levers which we all know how to use simple machines, and we know that we need to, we can interact with them to make things work. Anyway, so um, here's a top-down view of the work. So when a viewer would come and press on the lever, the bag would flip, and then the water inside would rotate. Um, for me, this was like super important for my work to see how people approached, interacted, and reacted to the piece. Um, Anyway, so while I was working on this, I was also working on more wearable stuff for Kansas City Fashion Week that I just showed in February. So as I'm working on this, I'm always like working in two different areas. Um, but I feel like a lot of the materiality and approach to color and material is the same. So in the image on the left, you can tell the model is carrying a little blue bag and it's filled with water. And then on the right, this is all like hand-dyed vinyl pieces. Um, but for me, in this collection, um, what was super important was combining materials and textures that you wouldn't see very often in clothing and, you know, kind of having people change their ideas of what is wearable. Um, here are a few more images on the left. She's wearing a quilted top filled with water. And then on the right is carpet padding with Spanish sequin. So um, anyway, I became really interested in combining unlikely materials, you know, changing our perception of them, etc. So here I'm working with the same idea in more sculptural based work, still hand dyeing everything and still having, a, have the, having the same approach to color. Um, but yeah, working more sculpturally and smaller for sure. Um, so yeah, these are some images. That's it. That's me. Thanks, guys. Hey, hello everyone. Um, my name is Virk Velin. I'm a Finnish-based photographer and artist. Um, as an introduction, I'd like to talk about how I got interested in photography. I was always curious about cameras and photography albums <coughs> since early age and started to take photographs when I was 10 years old. I carried a small keychain camera that I would take with me to school and make candid photos of my schoolmates. I was also interested in nature, animals and water, family members in their daily chores. This was before the mobile phone cameras and internet started to rule the world. When I was 19 and living in Helsinki, I got my first 35mm film, pocket camera, and started to move away from journalistic photography style towards more conceptual and constructed images. I would photograph plastic animals in strange settings and dolls flying in the air, shadows and light patterns on the walls of my room and details of plant structures. Using slide film allowed me to place images on top of each other and create double exposures after the film was already developed. Mm -hmm. I like to interfere with the image surface and make the image more layered and three-dimensional. Dreams became a source of inspiration, and I would keep dream journal along with photographing various themes. And <clears throat> these four images are from a series that I'll talk about later, but I can now just put them for you here. Um, this is called Ron of Mary. Ron is a river in Ardles, where I studied in 2009 and 2010. 
This is the Birds of Mary from 2009 as well. And the Flowers of Mary. Okay, back to history a little. By the time I was 21, I had joined the camera club and got my first SLR film camera with interchangeable lenses. Introduction to darkroom practice and lighting techniques was part of the club activities and I would show my photographs and get feedback from other photographers. I took part in the yearly exhibition and got my photographs exhibited. <clears throat> Natural patterns and details remained a recurrent theme in my photographs. How did I become a visual artist? At the age of 26, after studying art management, performance and music in England and Helsinki, I finally decided that I wanted to study photography on a university level and applied for the School of Art and Design, Helsinki, in Finnish called Taik. The exams went well and I got accepted to BA program in photography. I continued my studies and graduated with a master's degree in 2010. Since then, I have been a free artist and teacher in Helsinki. I have held both solo and group exhibitions since 2004 in Finland and abroad. Then about my current art practice. <coughs> That's the fourth image in the Mary's, Visions of Mary series, uh, the Trees of Mary. During my studies, I traveled to Ireland and Canada. Traveling freed the artistic ideas and made it possible to work in a creative flow. So I decided to travel again when it was time to start my final thesis. In 2009 and 2010, I studied in Arles, south of France, at the École Nationale Supérieure de la Photographie. During that time, I started using digital camera as a tool for documenting and re-identifying uh, re found objects. I took interest in archaeology of urban locations and geology. Aerial point of view towards subjects became dominant in the relic series that I will show here. I find it interesting how the fly-eye view changes the scale and perspective of photographed objects. I'm also interested in camera's ability to document material reality and give it a new form as a photograph. I'm inspired by structures of found objects, natural and man-made materials. And this series is my final work while I was working in France. And I photographed uh, found <coughs> textile pieces and clothing along the river in Arles. About my working method. My working method often follows a certain pattern including all or some of the following steps. Choosing a location, studying the maps of chosen area, walking, making observations, collecting samples of found material, documenting found objects, organizing collected materials. Finally, naming and displaying found material in photographic form and thus giving found object a second identity. This is a recent work that I did at the beginning of this year. It's called Elements, and the original name was Schoolyard Cryptic 1 to 3. By the time I was working with this series, the Connecticut school shooting happened, and I started to think about how we live in systems and uh, try to obey rules, and how everything is uh, coded, and there's a grid behind everything. Um, so I went to schoolyards and I collected these stones from schoolyards and started to put them in this code.
I usually work towards creating a series of photographs which holds a theme, rather than individual photographs. Side by side with realistic and carefully constructed photos, I also work towards more intuitively and subjectively driven images. This interaction and movement between accurate photographic documentation and introspective expressures of consciousness motivates me as an artist. And finally, I will, work, uh, I will show you more examples of my work. This is part of the series that I exhibited in February in Helsinki Lasipatsi exhibition space in a solo show called In the Beginning We Were One where I was photographing the codes made of rocks and then elements such as water, air and earth. And this one is called I Turn to You. Currently I'm working in Arteles Residency and continuing the Visions of Mary series and this is the second part of it, Visions of Mary 2. And this is the first image that I have ready, or I have more of them, but I chose this image to show you in this presentation. And it's called Revelation 2. Thank you. I was in Toronto and Peterborough. It's south from, from Toronto, maybe about less than 100 kilometers. Why did you go there? Why did I go there? Um, my husband is from there and we spent four months there living in a family residency and I was working there. Ar Arles. Yes. Um, I chose it because of the nature in there. Same reasons that I chose Arteles now for this April. Where is this Arteles? Arteles. Arteles is in Haukiari Hämeenkyrö. This is this residency that we are Where in. Is <laughs> <laughs> Have, have you seen any, any, any bigger city near Hamekura? Tampere. Yes, and you choose Hamekura because of the nature? Uh, yes, because I want it to be in peace and for my work it's really important to silence my mind of anything extra mm -hmm. because of the nature. What is, what is the passion? <laughs> what gets you? What, 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 how, how do you get the, the flames to your heart and uh, gets, you, gets you going? <laughs> um, where, where do you live? I live in Espo, <laughs> Finland. It's a very dull place. So where, where, do you, where, where do you get, get the kicks? Where do I get the kicks? Yes. Um, Kicks for me is very, um, it's very silent, silence, si silent experience in a way. It's not this kind of um, riot where there's like a lot of explosions in the air. It's inner peace is my kicks. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Like 
taas voisiko eroaa. Okei, great. Eli sitten me tarvitaan se... Ja tota sitten varmaan tuo kauko se Muistaako Pia näppäimen tämän piuhan ja tämän piuhan? Pitääkö siitä koneesta painaa? Täällä on vähän sinne keskellä. <clears throat> okay, hi everyone. <laughs> My name is uh, Sena Wolf. Um, um, first, I would like to thank uh, Pori Art Museum for giving us this opportunity to present our works and also the whole Artalist crew, Temu and Akwa, Akwa, just met, uh, for organizing that and wonderful Sanna and Rekka. <laughs> Thanks for that. And, um, <clears throat> About me, I was born in Poland, where I studied cultural theory at Wrocław University, and I've lived in New York for the past 12 years. Uh, last year, I graduated from Hunter College with my BFA degree. Um, my work uh, has included installation, sculpture, video, and performance. And excuse me for reading my notes, I just want to make it quick so I can um, show you a couple of my videos. Um, my first medium has been a drawing and later painting. The transition from painting to installation started with the desire to bring the investigation of the space I was examining on the canvas into the actual physical space. So the transition from 2D to three, to, from two to three-dimensionality 
has naturally brought the issue of the real versus unreal in its uh, full literality, and it has marked many of my works. Um, right from the beginning, I wish to um, um, I wish uh, for the viewer to be asking these questions um, of veracity himself. Therefore, I um, therefore I was creating um, the viewing experiences, which would shift the viewer's um, perspective and somehow see things from a different uh, angle. And uh, what I wished for the viewer to be questioning is his her position and attitude towards um, the general other. In this case, um, in the work called um, In Search of Soda Water, the other would be an egg. And <clears throat> in this installation, uh, eggs lay around the sculpture and the viewer maneuvers between them. The outside TV shows a video of performance recorded earlier in the completely dark room where a single egg was placed and the performer knew about it and was asked to um, find it and establish his attitude towards it. Um, this is... Um, hmm, not working. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is the actual sculpture. Um, one of the most uh, natural practices for me has been creating um, what people call rituals. Um, most of them are based on my dreams. Um, in here, um, the works, I still have a name, um, snaps, snapshots of each participating <coughs> person are placed under the dirt. Um, above hang empty bottles, and one by one participants dig in the dirt to find a photograph and place it in the bottle. Coincidentally, some people find images of themselves and friends find images of each other. Um, this practice of setting up um, rituals evolved to more elaborated project called Abraxas. And this installation uh, was made after a live performance ritual with a participant. It was based on an ancient Buddhist ritual of skinning people as a symbolic breakage between the physical and spiritual. Uh, performers uh, used techniques of yoga and medicine to achieve meditative yet alarming experience. So this is the installation that was built for the show after um, the actual performance. And here are stills from a video <coughs> made uh, for the recording of the performance. Um, I think about that time um, of when this work was done, called If You Can Dream It, I <clears throat> started to shift from placing the viewer uh, in often unpredictable experience into um, creating um, more narrative uh, mode for him. Um, I also uh, focus more on power dynamics that set the primary um, experiences for us at the first place. So rather, rather um, then rearranging the settings, the given settings, um, I deconstruct them to a narration. So this is more sculptural piece, um, but it's sort of, it says somehow still very associated story. And these are stills from a video I made after, um, after this installation. <laughs> um, so now I would like to show you a couple of my videos, and um, the first one is called Staircase B, and this was a really exciting um, work for me because um, for a long time I wanted to um, take an issue of um, work with an issue of uh, female in some so-called post-feminist society, and. The sound, sound is on right. Um,
These are excerpts from Maya Dharam, Meshes of the Afternoon. <laughs> second video um, is called uh, Project 888. Um, it's a sort of an allegory of um, creation, destruction, and um, I think this was um, this was uh, strongly influenced by the um, issue of uh, urban planning as a tool of social engineering.
That's it. Thank you.
All right. Uh, hi, my name is Allison Chen. I am from New York, born and raised, so I've lived in New York City for almost my entire life. Um, I did my undergrad in photography at Cornell University, which is about four hours uh, drive north from New York. Um, so I lived there for four years and then moved back. Um, and I recently graduated with my master's um, from Parsons in New York. Uh, so I thought it would be good today to just give you a brief overview of what I've been doing for the past two years. Um, since I started uh, grad school, I started working primarily with video. Um, so I thought I'd just show you a bunch of clips of uh, the work that I've been making and sort of the trajectory that I have been on. So for the past two years, my work has been a lot about codependency um, and this need or desire that I think every human has to connect with some with someone else or something else or something, something uh, along those lines. Um, and I'm really interested in the failure of that and the breakdown uh, that happens when you sort of realize that there is a boundary between you and someone else. Um, and this started when I traveled uh, on a residency in the south of France, not too far from Arles, um, in Marseille. Uh, it was the first time that I had traveled alone and gotten to a destination where I also didn't know anybody. Uh, so it was a very new experience for me and a very strange experience. Um, I was the only non-European participating in the residency, so I was you know, I had jet lag and I was the only one that was sort of adjusting to the change in language and the change in culture and everything. Um, and so I made a body of work entitled Someday Soon, uh, which is all about uh, my struggle to try to go home. Um, Um, so the series of performances that I created, um, I set up simple parameters for myself. I thought, okay, if I wanted to go home, which is, you know, this vast distance that obviously I can't cross, how would I attempt to do that with just my body, um, not relying on airplanes or cars or boats or anything like that? Um, and so I'm physically sort of doing this thing that's futile. Um, and each of the performances uh, are between like seven and nine minutes. Um, but I'm just going to show short clips for the sake of time because um, you can get an idea. I mean, it's just nine minutes of me trying to dig a hole uh, in a puddle that actually the bottom is iron, which I soon discovered after I was, you know, digging. So there really was no hole that I could dig. <laughs> there was a big iron plate underneath all of that mud and stuff. <laughs> um, That's me attempting to fly home. <laughs> um, and the best I can do is jump, which is kind of pathetic with all the seagulls in the background. But 
Um, I really I really like this sort of irony and humor that I use in my work because um, I think it highlights the the ridiculousness of the gestures that I'm uh, attempting to complete and the failure of being able to complete those actions. And the last one is me attempting to climb a hill that was pretty much completely like that. And with all of the performances, you the viewer quickly learns that the, the actions that I'm partaking in are pretty pointless. Um, the beginning of the video starts with me, you know, doing whatever I'm doing, climbing the hill or digging the puddle, and ends with me doing the exact same thing. So it's just this progression of time that sort of highlights uh, the, the inevitability of failure. Um, I never really get over the hill or anything remotely close to that. Um, and I, I do like intentionally set out to do that. I think um, originally I had wanted it to be this thing where I sort of get lost in something else um, and then realized the success of it was the inability of me to even do that. Um, and in addition to the video performances, I also uh, developed two audio pieces. Um, I was thinking about making phone calls to people in Marseille and trying to talk to them, not speaking any French, um, and sort of ask to speak to those that I was homesick for or wanted to uh, talk to, um, those people that reminded me of home. But I called, I don't know, maybe 20 numbers and not a single person picked up the phone. So I decided instead to leave uh, voice messages on their answering machines, pretending like I was calling home. Um, and I was thinking a lot about uh, when you travel and you are homesick, but when you call home, you know, you have this pressure to be like, oh, I'm having a great time. I'm having a lot of fun and doing a lot of stuff. Uh, so there's this weird, um, well, you'll see, I'll play it. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, just wanted to call you and tell you that things are going well. Um, I guess as well as they could be going. Everything seems to be, um, moving so quickly and yet so slowly at the same time, so... I guess it's a good thing. Oui, bonjour, c'est Monsieur Ricatelli. Je suis actuellement absent. Mais laissez-moi un message et je vous rappellerai dès mon retour. Merci. Au revoir. Sometimes I think I can hear you, but maybe like I'm carrying you inside my head. Mm. Anyways, I've been trying to call you. Mm. I guess someday soon. Um, so in the end, um, I I sort of like the idea that no one picked up because I grew really attached to the idea. Uh, there's something nice that like these messages were playing inside empty homes, um, and then I like thinking about you know people coming back and hearing those messages and being like, well, who is that? And you know like what's what exactly is going on? And are you talking to me or you know what's what's happening there? So I think that. The message has probably worked out better and more powerfully than uh, I had originally intended. Um, so after I got back, I started to think more 
um, more intently and more critically about why it is that we have this desire to connect with someone else. It's something I think that's you know that starts um, at birth. You're connected to your parents, and you have this dependency on on that, and then that translates into relationships with friends and romantic relationships and all of these sort of things. Um, and I one day stumbled upon this thing called the Love Calculator online. Um, this is not my work. This is something I found on the internet. Um, and I typed in the parameters of me and you, so the chances of me and you uh, in a successful relationship. And I thought that the text was great because it's this mixing of like it being totally possible and then it also being totally improbable. Um, so it reads, the chance of a relationship working out between me and you is very big, but a relationship is very well possible if, I'm sorry, is not very big, but a relationship is very well possible if the two of you really wanted to and are prepared to make some sacrifices for it. You'll have to spend a lot of quality time together. You must be aware of the fact that this relationship might not work out at all, no matter how much you invest in it. And the, this disclaimer at the bottom, I don't know if you can see it, but it says, it's not possible to get 100% probability. Therefore, there's no guarantee of any kind that the relationship will work out between these two people. So I really love this like possibility and then failure at the same time. You know, it's like completely vague. Um, and I, that's what I sort of became interested in. And so following that, I made a list. These are the moments that I have fallen in and out of love since 2005 and 2013, all in the same relationship. Um, and I started compiling these uh, going backwards based on like emails and text messages and memories and things like that. And I'm like continually adding to the list. Um, and I like this. I like the idea of the ridiculousness of like charting this thing, um, and also that the list of the times I'm out of love is actually not that short compared to the, to the list of the times I'm in love. Um, and I guess as long as it's not longer, I'm okay. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's that. Um, and following that, I created a book of a series of instructions entitled How to Fall in Love, which I have with me, so I'll pass around, but I also have a couple of examples. Um, so I started playing with this idea of, um, you know, how, how do we choreograph love and is, is this narrative that we construct about romance and romantic relationships really something real or is it something that we just sort of made up and buy into and believe? Um, and so I drew from a lot of things. I drew from uh, like popular culture, movies, romantic comedies, um, as well as things like self-help books and scientific research on love. There's a lot of things about like the chemistry of love and stuff like that. And so I, they, they range all over. Um, here, it's, it's all about uh, measuring temperatures and trying to create union through being in the same temperature. Um, so it says, well, you can read it. Um, but then there's all these sort of like nuances of things that are kind of strange, right? Like you want to be the exact temperature in order to create union between these two people. But then if you look at the footnote, it says temperatures may be rounded to the nearest tenth of a degree. So there really is no exactness. Um, to that, you know. Um, and then I'm also mixing things uh, in the methodology of these um, instructions with uh, poetic language and mixing the poetic and the scientific. So this says, rest your head inside the nook of another for one hour, which is, um, you know, a romantic gesture. It requires intimacy and it requires um, a certain affection for someone else, but then there's this like scientific description of exactly what the nook is. Uh, so at the bottom it says nook equals curved area of space along the neck between the chin and the shoulder. Um, and then there's this sort of uh, idea of repetition that you need to repeat it every day for one year and that eventually that will, you know, you two will somehow be puzzle pieces to each other or something. Um, and throughout the book, there are also points of cynicism um, to try to sort of pull the reader back and make them really think critically about what they're reading and like how much of it is really valid. Um, and so this just says, wait, keep waiting. And the footnote is, if you stop, you must start from the beginning. Um, so it's this perpetual thing that, you know, like it says that if you wait long enough, obviously something 
hopefully it will happen. And that's not really the best methodology for anything. <laughs> um, um, and lastly, this series about, uh, it says share a home, share a bed, share money, share clothes, share food, share fluids. Um, I was thinking a lot about behavior that we perform when we're in love and thinking about this conundrum of the chicken and the egg. So like, do we fall in love because we want to fall in love and so we create that for ourselves? And then can we fall in love by performing gestures that or behavior of people that are already in love? Um, so. um, and after I made the book, I decided to um, go ahead and carry out some of these instructions. Uh, I was sort of skeptical. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I was skeptical of what I made and sort of questioning whether any of it had any validity. So I thought that, hey, why not just try them? Um, so this is a set of instructions that um, says bear the weight of the other. Um, and then there's a footnote in the original instructions that said that says this weight contains muscles, fat, water, tears, history, organs, worries, bones, and fears. Um, and the entire video is like six minutes, but I just shared a short clip. Um, yeah, I, I like the fact that uh, he has no problem carrying me out of the frame, but it takes me seven minutes to figure out how to lift him off the ground. <coughs> How am I doing in time? Yeah, oh, sorry. Okay, I'll just skip through it quickly then. Um, this is another one, mirror the movements of the other. Um, I'm also really interested in the imperfection of the actions, obviously, um, pointing out sort of the impossibility to even complete some of these instructions um, and ideas of play. These are all on my website, so if you want to see the full version later. Um, the series of instructions for this is run into the other, collide. Um, and I was really interested in trying to break up cinematic space, uh, thinking about the outer two frames as portraits of the individual, um, and then the inner frame of this repetition of action of you know, trying to collide into the other and then sort of struggling and failing and doing it again because we're obviously not seeing the reaction that we want. Um, and so it's just an endless loop of us running through the field. Do you like the movie Allen? Yeah, I do a lot, actually. <laughs> Does this remind you of Woody Allen? Yes. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually not the first person to say that. Okay, one last one, and then I will let everybody go. Um, so this one is, the instructions are, check the, check the weather forecast for rain. When rainfall is constant, run outside. Stand face to face without any protection from the rain. When completely drenched, kiss. Uh, and the footnote says, the rain must be significant. A light rain or drizzle will not work. Um, and so again, I'm sort of playing, uh, playing, playing with the frame and thinking about um, how to uh, imply unity without actually having unity. And so we're standing on the same rock, except that we're 180 degrees rotated. So if we were there together, then, you know, we could engage in this kiss. But we're not. We're separated um, and sort of like playing that game you did in third grade where you pretend to make out with yourself. Um, yeah, uh, that's it. That's my website and my email. Thank you. If you have some questions, just feel free and have the show. Thank you.
thank you everybody for uh, it was really really very interesting and um, I'm not sure if you will continue somewhere after this but uh, I don't know what your plans are. Uh, but, but, me neither, yeah.